sermon text is 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 15. For though ye have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers? For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. I'll pray for Brother Boyce. Heavenly Father, we're praying for Brother Boyce that you would give him the words that uh, he wants to say and that they would be powerful and that all ears would be open and that we would be edified. In Jesus' name, amen. And thanks to all of you. I remind you of Hebrews 11:6. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he that comes to God must believe two things. What are they? That he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And not an option. The easy part is believing in God. The fool said in his heart, turning in God. The hard part is to believe that when you come many miles and sit all day long, <laughs> that God knows it. But God does. And he will not forget your work of faith and labor of love. And you must believe that it pays to be diligent. The text is 1 Corinthians 4.15 and again it takes a lot of pressure off of me to be in a group of people who are biblically literate because if I should stumble and fail or not mention something and I appreciate Dan mentioning 1 Thessalonians 2.13 the word of God can have free course you know it's alive <laughs> it's active it's sharper than the two-edged sword. It pierces to the dividing asunder, soul and spirit and joints and marrow. It discerns the thoughts and intents of the heart, and it can have free course in your life tonight. From my perspective, there are two things I want to talk about in verse 15. First is the difference between a guardian, an instructor, and a father. You may have 10,000 guardians or instructors, but not many fathers. Second thing is, by the word of God, I have begotten you through the gospel. So I want to talk about being begotten. First of all, I confess to you that I am fascinated by seeds. Uh, we live in the country, and a barnyard is a disgusting place to be. <laughs> If you got a cut on your foot or something, you better get a tetanus shot. There's a lot of bad stuff in a barnyard. But when you plant a watermelon seed out there, it grows and produces something sweet. Does that blow you away or what? <laughs> the word begot in Hebrew is yalad, found 498 different times in the Old Testament scriptures translated 14 different ways, but 201 times it is translated as begat or begot. In the New Testament scriptures, the Greek word for begot is ganao. It's translated six different ways, but 49 times it's also translated as begat or begot. There are two different meanings in my understanding of the word begat. It can mean a woman becoming pregnant. Psalm 2, 7, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. That happened in Nazareth. And Mary said, how can this be? Well, the Holy Spirit is going to come over you. That's how it's going to happen. And that holy thing will be called the Son of God. Boy, I tell you... <laughs> That's a powerful concept because it's a more excellent name than anybody else had, you know. Under which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son. Now, they may be called the sons of God in the book of Job, but no angel said, That's my son. 
And that's what God said about, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. That's his baptism on the Mount of Transfiguration. Moses and Elijah were there and the Lord added, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear ye him. He's going to explain the law. He's going to explain the prophets. Jesus is the <laughs> exegesis of God. That's the John 1, 18. No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. That's exeget, oh my, from which we get our English word exegete. The second meaning of yalad or ganao is to actually give birth. So in Matthew chapter 2, verse 1, the Bible says, And Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea. That is the genitive, singular, masculine, participle, aorist, first passive of ganao. It's the same word that happened nine months earlier. Jesus was begotten in Nazareth. He was begotten in Bethlehem. Same word, but different meaning. One time it meant you get pregnant. Next time it means you give birth. It's used in Luke 157. Same word with reference to the birth, not the conception, but the birth of John the Baptist. Now, when C. Everett Koop was the Surgeon General of the United States, he got together with a guy named Gary Bergdahl and they wrote a book called When You Were Formed in Secret. And it, uh, it's an amazing little booklet. I've given away dozens of them and I don't know whether they're still in print or not, but they said that when you were conceived physically, when you were conceived, there was the sperm from your daddy and the ovum or the egg from your mother there are 23 chromosomes from your daddy and 23 chromosomes from your mother. There are 15,000 genes from your daddy and 15,000 genes from your mother. The DNA is so tiny and microscopic, you could put 5 million DNA strands through the eye of a needle at the same time. And all of this combined, when you were conceived, and it was called a zygote coming from the Greek word which means join. And everything about you was there from day one. The fact that you would be a boy or a girl, the shape of your eyes, the, the color of your hair, the fact that you would have a heart that would beat 70 times a minute, pump seven tons of blood every day, the fact that you would have 40,000 miles of arteries and veins, and that every time your heart pumped, your arteries would relax and when it wasn't pumping they would contract. That provides a constant flow of blood to the extremities of the body. All of that was in the zygote from day one. The fact that you would have kidneys with 40,000 mounds of piping that would filter out 180 quarts of blood every day and return 178 to your system and two quarts of urine would be expelled as poisonous that you might have a healthy life. All of that was in the zygote that was you from day one. That your DNA never changes, your fingerprints never change, nothing changed. It was there from the moment you were conceived. There are three bones in your body that never grow. They're in the ear. That means that middle C on a piano sounds the same to the little children as it does to us old people. And kind of a parlor game to show you the intricacy of the hearing apparatus. You can get people in a circle, everybody close their eyes, somebody clap their hands, and you immediately know which direction the sound came from because as the sound enters one ear, and the other ear, there is a millisecond difference. And you can tell direction. A person with one ear can't do that. Same way with your eyes. There are 137 million rods and cones in your eye that enable you to see. And you, if you have two eyes, you can have depth perception. Per person with one eye has no depth perception. And there are 1.5 
million impulses in your eye every millisecond. And all of that, and this is the vile body. <laughs> this is the body of corruption. So Jesus said to Nicodemus, you've got to be born again. What are you talking about? Nicodemus, you're a teacher in Israel. You don't understand this? That was born of the flesh is flesh. Third day of creation, God created living things. Every living thing had a seed, and every seed reproduced after its own kind. If you want spiritual life, you have to plant a spiritual seed. You have to be born from above. God's our Father, which art in heaven. Hallelujah. So, you got to be born. You have to have a spiritual seed. We are born again, not a corruptible seed, but of the incorruptible, even the Word of God that lives and abides forever. The Word of God is not paper and ink. <laughs> you could burn every Bible on earth, and you couldn't destroy the Word of God. Heaven and earth pass away. Word of God won't. The, the words I speak unto you, they are spirit, and they our life. So, as we have borne the image of the earthly, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Can you imagine the intricacy of the spiritual seed that God, you know, now, you're either pregnant or you're not, ladies. There's no, you know, you're not kind of pregnant or somewhat pregnant or a little bit pregnant. You either are pregnant or you ain't. And the same principle applies to being born again. You're either born again or you're not born again. I mean, this is, this is not rocket science. You got you to gotta face that reality. However, just because you are immature doesn't mean that you don't have the Spirit of God in you. We need to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. I remember watching my father shave with a straight razor. And I've got it uh, at our, my house. When my daddy died, I got his razor and the cup and the brush that he used to lather up and everything like that. And I watched it. I wanted to be a man. I wanted to grow up. I wanted to shave, but I had to wait. But all of that was in the mind of God when I was conceived. The fact that we would have baby teeth and adult teeth, the fact that we'd go through puberty, the fact, you know, all of that was programmed in there. And just think, dear brother, don't get discouraged. Wait on maturity. You know, you know I had to stay at the family. I had to eat every day. <laughs> you know, famine and pestilence go hand in hand. If you don't eat right, you're going to get sick and you can die. So we lay aside all malice and guile and envy and evil speaking and as newborn babes we desire the sincere milk of the word if so be that you have tasted. Now you either taste or you don't. <laughs> you don't kind of taste. You either taste or you don't taste. And when you're born again, God begins doing something inside of you and don't get discouraged because next week, next year, something may click inside of your spiritual being that's going to transform your life and give you power to do exceeding abundantly above all that you can ask or think. That's what it means to be born again. Now, in 1 John, the word ganao is found six different times in 1 John, and I will go over them quickly. But again, when a woman gets pregnant within 48 hours, there is a test which will determine whether she's pregnant or not. Something is different. Something really happens. Amen. And the same way, if you are a new creation, something happens. Amen. And you can examine yourself to see whether you be in the faith. So 1 John 2 29, if you know that he's righteous, you know that everyone who does what is right has been born of him. That's ganao. It's a begotten. Same idea. In chapter 3, verse 9, Bible says, no one 
who is born of God will continue in sin because God's seed remains in him. He cannot go on sinning because he's been born of God. Chapter 4, verse 7, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God, and everyone who loves God has been born of God and knows God. Then chapter 5, now, oh, this is so significant. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ born of God and everyone who loves the Father loves the child as well. There's some, uh, some of you have traveled outside the country or even anyhow. When you meet a child of God, there's kind of an instant bond. Yeah, amen. And this comes from the Holy Spirit. That everybody that's born of God, it's family. Yeah. You love everybody else that's born of God. And then the fifth time is verse 4. Everyone born of God overcomes the world and then... Finally, in verse 18, we know that anyone born of God does not continue to sin. For the one who was born of God keeps him safe, and the evil one cannot harm him. Now, in the year 2000, there was a homeless man on the streets of Santa Cruz de la Sierra, Bolivia, 67-year-old drug addict and alcoholic, and he got word the police were after. So he vamoosed, has not been seen since, as far as I know. But the police were not going to arrest him. He had been married to a woman named Ines Gajardo Olivares, and she inherited $6 million and died. But she had forgiven her son, Tomas Martinez, she had forgiven him. And so she left her will, leaving $6 million to her husband who had abandoned her. And he never knew it. And they advertised, in that, as far as I know, he's never been found. They advertised in the newspapers and everything else, Tomas, <laughs> somebody died and left you a fortune. And he's running away from it. Oh, brother and he came unto his own and didn't like it, didn't want him. He, Adam, where are you? I love you. I, God so loved the world. He's not any willing that any perish. Adam, I want to help you. Where are you? Zacchaeus, come on down. I'm going to your house today. Amen. And we run away from him not realizing that we are joint heirs with him. Amen. And he's not, he's not after you because of your sin. He took care of that on the cross. And he wants you to be his child. He wants you to be a part of the family. Amen. The second thing in this verse talks about, King James Version says instructors, New International says guardians. There's a difference and everybody ought to know it. I was in Brazil. I was talking to uh, the sister of Anita, and she's well acquainted with Araguaína. Jim Moreland has worked in this city in Brazil for, I guess, over 50 years. And uh, when I was down there, he told me this story, and I'm a little reluctant to repeat stuff. There's so much fake news going on, so many urban legends. And I said, Jim, would you mail me documentation about that? So this is an article, and it's 1974, March the 5th, the Portuguese Brazilian version of People Magazine. The title is, Failure to Help Drives Doctor Insane. And this is the translation from Portuguese by Philip Moreland and Joanna Bayless. A doctor from a private clinic in Pituba, an upper middle class district in Salvador, Bahia, was hospitalized in a psychiatric clinic, clinic in the capital of Bahia. He was in a trauma because of what happened to his son. According to the newspaper, Canal de Brasil, the story was unknown until last week, but last Tuesday it was confirmed by the administrator of the emergency hospital 
Jair C. Lopez, and by the Legal Medical uh, Institute, uh, Naina Rodriguez, and also by Gregorio Sacramento, they wrote down what happened. This is what happened. This kid run over by hit and run driver, taxi driver, picks him up, takes him to the hospital, Our Lady of Light. Doctor says, pay up, give me the kid's papers. Said, I, he's not my kid. It was 2,000 cruzeiros, which would be about two bucks US. Had no papers, no money. Doctor says, can't help you. Taxi driver puts the kid back in the car, heads to the next hospital 12 kilometers away, kid dies. Because the patient died, they investigated, now I'm quoting, with the death of the boy, it became necessary to investigate the case. It was determined that the child had died because the doctor refused to help. This turned out to be a coincidence that usually happens only in the movies or television. We discovered the tragic circumstances that the doctor had failed to attend and thus condemned to death his own son. You have 10,000 instructors, not many fathers. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, Don't you call your brother Raka. There's something about a label that is dehumanizing. Don't you call your brother fool. My wife went to a big church as a visitor probably 65 years ago and the preacher was shaking hands with somebody and looking at the next person. You know, you have a lot of people, and they're just people, you know. But I guarantee you, if his son came through the line, he'd have a different attitude. There is a difference. There's a difference between just having a student in the class and having your son or your daughter. Paul said, I, I didn't look at you from a professional standpoint. That's what the hucksters do. 2 Corinthians 2.17. We're not of them that corrupt the word of God. There's some people that get like a guy on the midway at the local fair. Come on in. Knock down the cupid dolls and win a teddy bear, whatever, you know. Come on, come on, come on. They don't care about you. Don't know. They're not. Paul cared. Amen. I'm telling you the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience spared me. Witness in the whole. I have a great said there's continual sorrow in my heart for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh or Israel. I could wish myself accursed from Christ if they could be saved. What a difference. Here in our text, he said, you know, uh, we're fools, you're wise. We're hungry, you're well fed. We're in rags, you're not. We're homeless. I'm not writing this to shame you. Because you may have 10,000 instructors, not many fathers. And I'm setting an example for you. One of the problems we have in society today is that the absent father and the kid growing up has no role model to know how to be a father. And the same thing can happen in the church where you have professionals that come and do their thing and bail out. She said, I'm not that the good shepherd doesn't do that. A good shepherd will lay down his life for the sheep. The smallest baby to survive, as far as we know, Emilia Grabarczyk. She was born the 26th week of her mother's pregnancy. She weighed only eight ounces. A banana averaged about seven ounces. She was 8.6 inches long. The reason they took her by C-section was that there was a problem in the mother's womb and the placenta was not providing nourishment for this unborn child. And the doctor in Germany, Dr. Sven Scheimeyer, said if we don't take the baby, she can't live. 
Well, Lagis, I saw she was alive and doing well. But she had a daddy. You know, Planned Parenthood doesn't care a snap of the fingers about Amelia unless they could sell her, get body parts and so forth. But a father, Gina, don't think differently. That's my daughter. Amen. Hebrews 2.11 says that Jesus is not ashamed of us because we have the same father. He's, you know, Roy Rogers and Dale Evans gave birth to a retarded baby. This has been many years ago, probably 50 years ago. I don't know. And in those days, the word was put the baby in an institution and don't tell anybody that you have a retarded child. Dale Evans went to Norman Vincent Peale and said, what should I do? Anyhow, she celebrated that baby and wrote a book called Angels Unaware. Unaware. What a shame. This is my daughter. And God sent her. I'm not ashamed. She's my daughter. I'm not ashamed of her. Gene Stallings, football coach in Alabama, famous guy. One son named Johnny, born mentally retarded with heart condition. They didn't think he'd live to be four years old, couldn't count to 10. But he had a daddy. Not many fathers, but he had one. And Gene poured his life into little Johnny Stallings. By the grace of God, he lived to be 46 years old. Here's some of the things, you know, he wrote a biography about him. But anyhow, he was an honorary high school diploma from Dallas Christian School. The Change the World Honor from Abilene Christian University an equipment room named for Johnny Stallings at the University of Alabama, a playground named for him at the University of Alabama, a football field named for him at the Faulkner University, lifestyle statue of him with his daddy at Faulkner University, named the Paul Harris Fellow at Rotary International, made an honorary Marine by the U.S. Marine Corps, Texas A&M Class 57 endowed a medical school scholarship in his honor. He proudly represented Texas the International Special Olympics. He was featured in the only United Way commercial for the NFL. He received the Alabama Sports Festival Medal, which was carried to, on the space shuttle. He kicked off the first down for down syndrome associated with the NFL Arizona Cardinals. He appeared on the Today Show, Dateline, ABC specials. He was featured in People Magazine, Reader's Digest, many Christian publications. He was a Sunday school teacher working with four-year-olds. One university included him and a special list of five people who changed the world. He was baptized into Christ, 1985, and name written down in the Lamb's Book of Life in Heaven. Amen. He had a father. Guardians don't care that much. They're on the take, you know. The Russia figured out that a daddy will take care of his son for nothing better than a highly paid babysitter. Have we figured that out? There was a certain glory associated with the old covenant. I'm going to go, and I appreciate James mentioning 2 Corinthians 3.18. The, uh, there was a glory the word glory in Hebrew is kabod. And it has a literal meaning. It means literally heavy. Eli was 98 years old. He was sitting on a rock. The ark had been captured, and a runner came and said, the ark has been captured. Your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead. And Eli fell over backwards, broke his neck, because he was kabod. He was heavy. Absalom sheared his head every year and weighed it. It was, come on, it was heavy. And so the hippies 40 years ago would say, man, <laughs> that's heavy. 
So they're just looking at Mount Sinai and man alive. There was lightning and thunder and, and even Moses. He couldn't take it anymore. He said, that's heavy, man. Glory. Glory. So Paul wrote to the Corinthians. Now, if the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in letters on stone, came with glory, and it did, so that the Israelites could not steadfastly look at the face of Moses because of its glory, fading though it was, will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious if the ministry that condemns men is glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? For that what was glorious had no glory now in comparison with the surpassing glory, <laughs> and it was what that was fading away came from glory, how much greater is the glory that lasts? Now we're talking about being begotten of God. We're talking about the fact that he who's begun a good work and you will complete it. And we grow a little at a time from one degree of glory to another. And so that chapter concludes with this verse. I'll give it to you in the King James. We all with unveiled face behold as in a glass the glory of the Lord. And while we do that, we are constantly being transformed from one degree of glory to another, and this happened by the Spirit of God. Nathaniel Hawthorne wrote a short story that I think was a commentary on this verse. It's called The Great Stone Face, and it goes, this is just a little snippet, a brief summary of the story. High up in the white hills of New Hampshire, there was carved out by God in the perpendicular side of a mountain the likeness of a stone face. Now, if you got too close, you couldn't see it just ponderous and gigantic stones heaped in chaotic ruin one upon another. But if you got back far enough, <laughs> the great stone face seemed to come alive. And when the cloud swirled around the top of the mountain, it seemed like he had gray hair. And when the thunder reverberated through the valley, it seemed like he was trying to speak. In the shadow of the mountain, a little boy was born and they named him Ernest. And his mother would take him out and show him that face and say, Ernest, someday a man's going to come looking like that. The Indians have had this legend for generations. Going to look just like that. He's going to be kind and thoughtful and want, the personification of everything good you've ever thought. And little Ernest, he'd just clap his hands and Mom, I want to see him. I want to see him. And this became the passion of his life. As a teenager, they said, he's on his way. He was born in the valley, gone out and become the wealthiest man in the world, coming back for retirement. Everybody standing on tiptoe shouting and Ernest said, that ain't him. That's a little bit of resemblance, but I've been looking at him all my life and that's not him. And so that's the story of his life that over and over, one false alarm, the next time it was a general, then it was a politician. Then it, every time, everybody, that's the one! He looks like the great stone face to a hair. And he said, no, I didn't. Now he is old. His back was bent, his hair was gray. But every night he'd look at that man and meditate, and the people would come, Ernest, I got a problem. I got, would you help me? And so many people gathered. He got up on a little, on the side of the mountain, in a little, like a pulpit almost, and a beautiful green tapestry around him. And on this particular night, they said that the face of Ernest was imbued with a grandeur of expression that seemed to embrace the world. And the people looked at the face of Ernest. And behind him, they looked at the face on the mountainside. They saw the white hair of Ernest, and they saw the clouds around the mountain. And they threw up their hands by an irresistible impulse. And they said, Ernest is himself the image of the great stone face. And we all, with unveiled face, we look like in the mirror, we see Jesus. And if we keep looking, we're gonna go through a metamorphosis, a transformation. And we shall be like him. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, thank you 
that we can be begotten by you, that we can become the children of God by faith, that we can be baptized into Christ and put on Christ. And if we belong to you, then we are also Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Amen.